Hello everyone and welcome to today's webcast, State of Cyber Threat Intelligence Address. My name is Trevor and I will be moderating this webcast. Today's featured speaker is Rick Holland, Principal Analyst for Security and Risk Management at Forrester Research. Before I turn things over to him, the Q&A portion will take place at the end of the webcast. Please feel free to submit your questions at any point by using the questions window. Right now, I'd like to turn things over to Rick. Thanks, Trevor. Appreciate the introduction, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. I know y'all all have uh, real jobs and, and, and are busy these days, so I appreciate you taking time. I thought I'd do a little uh, State of the Union uh, on Threat Intel. You know, the, the President's State of the Union address is a couple weeks away, so I thought I would just uh, follow suit and do something similar for the Threat Intelligence space. Um, Now, I just want to demonstrate my amazing GIMP skills here as I tried to weave in some of my State of the Union shtick. Um, I've got a lot of opportunity to improve my ability there, but I think it's a funny picture. Um, before we start, uh, and if you, I don't know if, I don't know how many people actually watch the State of the Union address. Um, it's, it's interesting, um, but you may or may not be aware that they do drinking games for them. Um, so I thought I would uh, do a drinking game for this State of the Union address. So the first thing is, anytime you hear real-time attack tracker, you need to take a drink and say derp 20 times. Uh, if I use the word fusion, you need to mix two drinks of your choosing. If I use the term actionable intelligence, uh, you need to get speared by Terry Tate and take a drink. Some of you may get that joke, and I'll expand on that in a bit. If you hear attribution, take a drink and get a tattoo of Kim Jong-un on your forehead. And then finally, if you hear sticks, uh, share a drink with a colleague. Maybe uh, someone across the cubicles on the same webcast with me. Um, I won't go through the agenda. Obviously, we're going to go through here. One thing I did want to point out, I've got the hashtag for the CTI Summit for the actual event here. Um, we'll, I'll be live tweeting at the actual event when we have it. But the other thing I was going to mention is Threat Intel. Um, this is kind of... You know, DFIR is a good hashtag, great hashtag for, for the IR guys. Threat Intel is growing uh, for the CTI space. Um, it's been more vendor content up until the past month or so, and so we're seeing more, uh, more practitioners asking questions, posting things. So if you use Twitter, I would uh, encourage you to use the Threat Intel hashtag. You might see some interesting things on there. Uh, to start off with, I thought I would give a little bit of perspective on the investment M&A um, land space. Land Land space, <laughs> landscape. Uh, you may have seen just this week uh, on Monday, iSight Partners announced a $30 million uh, C round uh, with Bessemer Ventures. That's a nice round for iSight. Um, iSight's been in this space for quite some time. You know, one of the one of the first players there. And iSight also has Blackstone as an investment behind them as well. Uh, so that that's a nice round for for iSight. Um, look at these two guys over here uh, on the left. Uh, I think Adam and Rich are talking about actionable intelligence and fusing it on their screen right now. But Threat Connect uh, had an A round, and they did $4 million, um, a month or so ago. And this was me. I forgot when it was, but they actually changed the name from Cyber Square to Threat Connect. Uh, just uh, beginning of December, ThreatStream did a round, a $22 million round, uh, to, to, to continue their threat intelligence pl platform. And I'm going to dig into the threat intelligence platforms um, as we kind of continue. On the M&A front, uh, earlier in uh, Q4, we saw BitSight acquire Anubis Networks, and Anubis, um, Portuguese uh, threat intelligence uh, firm, probably similar to Norse Corp, um, you know, uh, as far as what they're collecting and real-time threat tracker, that sort of thing. You know, I expect there to be more of this type of stuff throughout 2015. This space is so hot. Um, I think you could just use, if you mix the word cyber and intelligence, you probably get you know VCs to pipe up and take a meeting. Um, it's pretty crazy how much activity is happening here. What I thought I would do next is move into the threat intelligence provider space. I'm, I'm working on research now. I talked about some of this last year at the Threat Intel Summit. I was previewing it. I'm finishing up a threat intelligence provider research right now. It's probably going to publish in February, early February, something like that. Um, so this is a third party. Um, firms that are out there providing an intelligence service of some sort. Um, I, I exclude, when I talk about providers, I exclude um, the kind of threat data that all of the security firms have uh, in their threat clouds and off their firewalls and IPSs and endpoints. But before 
I kind of continued on that line. I wanted to, to look back at something I did three years, almost, well, two and a half, three years ago um, this spring. Um, and this is the My Thread and Tell Can Beat Up Your Thread and Tell. Now, some of you, if you've been listening to me for a while, have heard me talk about this. I, but I continue to bring it up because it continues to be relevant. This was May of 2012 um, when I wrote this blog. Um, it was actually one of the first things that I wrote as I was covering the space. Um, but it's still very valid today. The, the interesting thing here is that it's expanded. And, and when I originally wrote this, this was about the kind of threat data that the semantics, the McAfee's, and the Cisco's of the world have. When you would see uh, slides that say, I have uh, 20 million uh, IP addresses. I have 4,000 uh, 4, URLs, email addresses, IP addresses, endpoints, talking about the side of their threat intelligence networks. Um, and it was just, it was getting to me, so I, I wanted to talk about it there. Uh, but what it's expanded to now is this. Uh, my threat report can beat up your threat report. Uh, these days, everybody has to have a threat report, and uh, it's hard to keep track of all the threat reports that are out there. It continues on to my attribution can beat up your attribution. So everyone is doing attribution and trying to one-up each other with their attribution. It continues on to my real-time threat attack tracker can beat up your real-time real -time threat attack tracker. There's a mouthful. Uh, you actually saw Brian Krebs do something uh, just this week where he was going through the real-time attack, uh, real-time whatever the attack maps that are out there. Uh, Anubis, uh, Norse Corp has, has those. Um, pretty crazy. Um, those. The thing I would say about them is they're pretty interesting. They're, they're, they're interesting to look at, um, and I know we've got a click going on. I'm hearing it here, too. I'm not sure what it is, but um, I, can't, I can't fix it, so I apologize for that. Um, uh, don't get distracted by them. They might be neat to have on a sock or something like that, but if it's not relevant to my organization and what's happening to my company, I want to see a real-time attack tracker for my company, my peers, my uh, other, other folks um, in, in other verticals uh, similar to me. Uh, I, I'm not so much compared about what's happening globally. I mean, it's nice to look at, um, but at the end of the day, I, I want relevancy to me, and I'm going to talk more about that. I also want to give a shout-out to something I did before as well, but it's still really relevant. And this is the Terry Tate Office Linebacker. For those of you who attended last year's summit, I had this slide, and this is on actionable intelligence. I'm hearing actionable intelligence all the time, and it's absolutely, you know, a beating because everyone has actual intelligence. And I've done research where I've completely you know, divined it from my perspective, and I won't dig into that now. I talked about that at the summit last year. But this still continues to be a challenge. You know, I did this blog before RSA talking about how much we'd see actual intelligence. I don't know if you saw it, but David Bianco uh, from Mandiant, he did one uh, shortly after uh, RSA last year uh, where he had, I think he interviewed 12 vendors and asked them what intelligence meant to them. And there was a different... Uh, a, a different answer, I think, for 10, uh, ten of them. Um, so it's kind of interesting there. This is still very much uh, nebulous in the space. Uh, of the characteristics that I use, relevancy is the one that is probably at the top of the list for me. There's others that are important as well, but uh, this is how I kind of look at it. You've got this global intelligence, you know, this high-level stuff. A lot of the attack maps that are out there are, are providing this. This could be commodity attacks. This is what we're seeing across the globe. As you move down in relevancy, it's your vertical, maybe your region, maybe your region and your vertical, and then finally at the bottom you have what's specific to your organization. I want to be moving down this pyramid. Uh, operating at that top, top level is great, but if I have a limited amount of money to spend, I don't want to spend it on commodity information that I could get from anybody. You know, I want to know something specific. Now, I will say, you know, you, you kind of struggle here uh, for vendors to provide this. I think most people are working at the global. You know, if, uh, some of the different examples, you know, iSight partners will, will go to market with the playbook versed on the attacker, the, uh, the threat actors that might target you, so criminal, uh, hacktivist, espionage. Uh, critical intelligence is a startup that focuses specifically on the energy space. Uh, they do that. There's others, but those are two that come to mind that are working more in that middle tier versus that commodity. So if you hear someone talk about their intelligence or you're looking at third-party intelligence, um, start asking them where they fit and what specific uh, to your vertical, to your region that you operate in, and then ultimately to your company. It's really, really important. In fact, and before you even go out to third parties, you need to be collecting it on the inside. That's the first place to start. So I'll just kind of move on from there. 
Sony Pictures. Uh, I was making jokes on Twitter that I would spend the entire hour talking about Sony, and I won't do that, but I will definitely uh, bring it up a little bit. Um, everyone's got an opinion on Sony. You know, watching Twitter these days is exhausting. It's an absolute um, beatdown. Um, you know, I, I personally, I think the FBI has kind of fumbled uh, their communications and justifications um, on this. Um, my joke here is I should have Joe Biden come out and, and run the uh, PR for this. He might have been able to do a better job. Uh, you know, you do have groups of people that aren't going to believe anything that the government says. Um, that's, that's natural. I think it's disingenuous to call people that question what the government's saying um, uh, tinfoil hat guys. You know, as the NSA leaks have demonstrated, you know, tinfoil hats aren't so uh, uh, aren't so on the outside. You know, and yesterday when the uh, FBI Director Comey came out and talked, I, I don't think he did a great job for this. You know, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, because of things like this, the intelligence community has a black eye. Because of the Snowden leaks, the intelligence community has a black eye. Um, although it's interesting, a lot of times the IC gets blamed for things that politicians ultimately are responsible for. And full disclosure, I. I came from Army Intelligence. Many of you know that, so um, it's been quite some time. It was, you know, first first job out of high school type of, of deal in four and a half years. But um, there's definitely a bad perception. Um, and, and one of the examples that I think would be useful here, and this is something that I did when I was in the Army, actually something very similar to this, uh, was declassifying satellite imagery. This was in between the wars. And I was actually in Kuwait at this time, and, and Iraq was massing on the border of Kuwait, feigning, uh, perhaps, well, it was feigning another invasion of Kuwait. So uh, the government unclassifies satellite imagery, releases it, and you can clearly see this stuff. Um, dig it to something that's more recent. Uh, here's NATO um, satellites, and this is Russian troops inside the Ukraine, right? This is evidence of, of wrong wrongdoing or whatever, you know, it supports the, the case, uh, the, the, the case that the government's trying to make. I think the U.S. should consider a formal policy on how they're going to declassify this type of information. You know, even yesterday in what, the, what Comey talked about, they didn't release any actual technical threat data. You know, they gave perspective that was uh, other sources of information that were out there. You know, if, I've always thought personally if it's accurate, you know, it's the NSA. We have signals intelligence. We have human intelligence that's confirming this. It's not just the cyber uh, threat data that we have or the cyber intel, the malware intelligence that, that, that's going. I think it, there's a reason we call it all source intelligence. Um, you know, those in the private sector only have one lens. Um, those that are one perspective, those within the intelligence community have a few more, but no one has all of them, right? Intelligence is not 100%. Uh, uh, it's a, it's, it's a, I don't know, it's a best guess. Um, Often, but I think the government needs to have some type of process to do declassification on this. The challenge that you have here, and I've been tweeting about this this week, is is sources and methods. The government doesn't want to give up sources and methods, or they have to balance the decision: is it worth giving up burning a particular source, a signal source, a human intelligence source, you know, to to make the case for the Sony um, North Korea Guardians of Peace hackers? And clearly, the intel loss here. Um, it wasn't worth it, and they haven't given that information up. So this process has is, is, is happened, um, but I don't think we should just believe everything the government says. And I really think they need to come up, as we're, as we're going through the ropes, learning how we're going to respond to state attacks, respond to these types of things, what type of you know, responsible disclosure and sources and method balancing is going to happen. I think there's, there's more opportunity here. You know, I think the government intelligence community needs to have the private security community on their side. I, you know, I think all these different perspectives that we've seen from Norris and CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike, Jeffrey Carr, all the different folks out there, there's value, right? And the more perspectives we have that are better, um, I think we need to be endearing ourselves to these groups, you know, not, not ostracizing them, tinfoil hatting them. I don't think that's the right approach. Um, now, if you don't watch the State of the Union addresses, you might not get this joke, but um, I'm going to take a quick pause for a, uh, for a drink of water myself as, as we continue on. If you haven't seen this uh, with Rubio, it's pretty funny. Go back and take a look at it. Now, in, in all this talk of attribution that's been, been going down, um, one thing that I wanted to go, and I'm not going to dig into this because I've done a lot of research on it, but I wanted to walk through this. You know, if you look at your needs as a security organization, 
where does attribution rank? Now, for me, I don't even really call it attribution because I don't think the private sector companies have a lot of business focusing on attribution. Uh, it goes back to the all source uh, statement that I made before. We don't have all source capability. Uh, we have a few different sources of intelligence, um, whereas the government has much more capability, can subpoena. ISPs get IP addresses, all kinds of things that we can't do. I, I would say adversary intelligence. I actually did some research that published, I think, in October or September on using adversary intelligence, going through the challenges of attribution, um, how you should actually start gathering uh, adversary intelligence based on the attacks that have actually occurred in your, org in your organization, building up a, a uh, portfolio on these incidents, what's the infrastructure that's being used, what's the tools that's being used. You know, there is value in understanding who's targeting you, but for most organizations, they're not at that level of maturity. And this is what I developed that targeted attack hierarchy of needs for in the spring. I would get organizations that call in and they want to buy a sandbox. That's their strategy for 2014 or 2015. Threat intelligence is their strategy. I've had retail companies that are standing up uh, threat intelligence teams, you know, bringing in four or five guys from the intelligence community. And I'm, I, he's a sale, I, let me pause. I was a sales engineer and I worked uh, with a lot of retail companies, and they're very much pre-target, a checkbox compliance thing. I have very immature uh, security. I think many organizations are jumping the gun on threat intelligence and, and, are, and are in no, no way ready to actually have uh, a significant investment in threat, threat intelligence. There's things like two-factor authentication on VPNs, uh, you know, not having the same local administrator password and username across your entire environment, a lot of fundamentals that are missing. And I think if organizations start focusing um, on these silver bullets being threat intelligence, um, identity analytics, insider analytics, all these you know, interesting things that do have some value, but they, they're not operating at the bottom of, the, the, of this pyramid, they're going to have a problem. As David Bianca says, everyone's got to have a pyramid. Or I don't know if it's Kyle Maxwell, one of the two, as we were talking about the pyramid of pain on Twitter one, one time last year. But there's my pyramid. But it starts at actually having a strategy. What's your organization trying to do? Um, it's not about technology, it's not about security, there's business, there's a mission, something needs to be accomplished. I have people as a second level, right? All of these tools, we need analysts to make things work, right? Uh, I've used this analogy of Jack Ryan on the threat intel side. Uh, we need analysts there to, to have this, and we need to have a, uh, creative ways to retain them. Uh, the fundamentals, which I, which I mentioned. Uh, orchestration, automation, this is actually a, once I get probably into Q2, I'm going to be doing more research on you know, security automation. I think there's a lot of stuff that we need to have there. We've got, I call it expense and depth, we just keep buying lots and lots of, of junk, and it's a Frankenstein infrastructure, nothing works together, nothing connects. You know, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very sexy to say create friction for the attackers. Um, I'd like to say let's be introspective, and what about all the internal friction that we have? Um, we have a ton, right? So what if we could turn this internal friction and reduce it? You know, the byproduct of that will be friction for the attackers. Um, prevention's not dead. If you hear prevention is dead from an incident response company, right, the flag should be going up. Prevention changes. Obviously, we get some diminishing returns from our traditional signature-based AV, signature-based um, intrusion prevention. Speaking of signatures, threat indicators are signatures. We can get overwhelmed with threat indicators as well. Um, uh, so prevention is, is, is not dead, it's changing. There is actually some interesting things on the prevention side that are coming out from a technology perspective. But ultimately, against a sophisticated adversary working at the top tier um, that can spend lots of money to target you and has resources, you know, detection and response is your ultimate uh, fallback. So we really need to be focusing on detection and response, but not giving up on prevention. I won't go any more into this. You know, my main key is before we start chasing attribution rabbit holes, we need to have an actual strategy, and threat intelligence is a key component of that. But you know, don't put the cart before the horse. You know, don't count your eggs, eggs before they hatch. Whatever analogy you want to use. Um, threat intelligence platforms. So I thought I would give um, a little bit of a teaser here. I mean, it's going to be a little bit more than a teaser, but um, on this kind of emerging space, and I've written about it at a high level in, in previous research, you know, over a year ago as this stuff was, was emerging, but I'm actually doing a detailed report. I mentioned I was doing a market overview on, uh, on, a, on threat intelligence providers, CrowdStrikes, iSight Partners, IID, Norse, those, those sorts of players, but I'm also doing one on the threat intelligence platforms. I was actually going to try to do one report, but it was just so gigantic it's going to be multiple. So I'm taking a, dig, a deeper um, look into this. 
this will probably finish up this quarter. Um, we'll see. I always joke, uh, my vendors appreciate this. Um, research uh, agendas or research timelines are like product roadmaps. They're always uh, subject to slippage by a quarter or two. Now, some vendors will say maybe three or four quarters, Rick, because um, of my travel schedule. So maybe that's the case. But I am, I am focusing on this. Um, I'm, I'm probably for my presentation at the CTI Summit, I'm probably going to dig into this a little bit more than I am right now. Um, but let's talk about it. Um, the first piece, and if you've been on webcast with me over the past, this is the typical graphic, this is from one that was maybe a year and a half ago, that I used to kind of, at a high level, demonstrate operationalization of threat intelligence. And I have three phases. On the left, you've got all of your intelligence sources. And at the bottom, I just want to point out, absolutely important, I already mentioned it once, internally derived intelligence. Right? Before we go out and buy anything, before we spend money on anything, better be doing something there, otherwise we're wasting um, our, our resources. But we have all of our sources on the left. That could be government, that could be ISACs, that could be the commercial stuff you pay for. This could be, you know, B2B sharing, you know, with your trusted partners. You know, you're an oil and gas company, you're sharing with another oil and gas company, whatever the, the case might be there. Um, in the middle, we have the analysts that's trying to deal with all this stuff. The problem is it comes in different formats, you know, structured and unstructured. Um, the analyst has to transform this stuff. Uh, I have programmatically written there, but it could be manually in, in a lot of cases. The analyst has to triage, get context, validate, do analysis. And then they have to get it over to the right-hand side um, for all the security controls that we have. Um, and, and it's a big problem. Um, I'm, what I'm probably going to do, talking about future research, is be breaking each of these sections down because there's a lot of subtasks that are occurring here. Uh, but at a high level, this is how I like to focus on it. And I'll go back to the analyst uh, component there. And you'll look, this guy's drowning, even though he's got two monitors. If they're using a SIM for this stuff, they probably need three or four, three or four monitors just to make sense of it all. But analysis is the key component. You know, one of the if, one of the biggest takeaways I would say at this point, from my perspective on threat intelligence platforms, is they need to be doing analysis. Uh, we don't need another source of information um, that's going to overwhelm us, right? We don't need to be overwhelmed. Uh, so that's a big problem. Um, so I just want to mention that analysis is a key component. And we'll dig a little bit more into this, but as, as you look at the space, here's a couple. This isn't inclusive. Um, I have probably even more. I'm hearing more startups that are doing this. There's people that use the term that I don't know that I really feel like they are. Um, uh, actually what they say they are. But here's some of the players in the space. I already mentioned ThreatStream and ThreatConnect uh, in, in the uh, M&A um, uh, investment section there at the front. Um, you've got Vorstack, ThreatQuotient. Um, BAE uh, has got uh, a platform there as well. You've got Looking Glass as well. You also have, when you go to the financial services, big firms or Department of Defense or three-letter three -letter agencies, you know, you will see the palantirs of the world and the analyst notebooks that are playing a role here. Um, I'll, I'll pause for a second because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to table one comment because it's going to come up in future slides. We also have CRITS, um, which many of you um, have, have CRITS, CRITS has gone open source, came, came out of the, the MITRE organization. It went open source last year. Actually, I think a gentleman named Reed did a presentation on CRITS at the very first uh, Threat Intelligence Summit that we had. It's an open source solution that plays here. Of course, many organizations don't have the, the resources to actually operationalize something like CRITS. Um, and then on the far end of the spectrum, I mentioned the Palantirs and the, um, the analyst notebooks of the world. They're, they're challenged uh, with not having the resources for that, you know, to have people permanently embedded in your, in your organization to be able to run that stuff. Um, I want to talk about SIM for a second too, though. Uh, we love to hate on SIM. The analogy that I use for SIM is that SIM is like driving a car while looking in the rearview mirror at night with your lights off. You know, for and SIM vendors, maybe there's some SIM vendors on the call. You know, probably won't like that statement, but few people will actually argue with that. It takes a lot of resources to successfully operationalize a SIM. Now. I used to, to run Splunk at a university that I was at, even before they had their SIM component. I sold lots of SIMs um, when I was a sales engineer, and now I work with customers on SIM. So anyone that argues that, that SIM is, is what we want it to be is, is, is that's a tough argument, I think. 
Um, but this is what we have, right? And here's a Rumsfeld quote from, from the second Iraq war. You know, his quote was around the army that you have. Well, for many organizations, the sim is what they have, and they're going to have to try to make it work. Um, the threat intelligence platforms have kind of come up and, and are, are taking away some of the, the analytic function that might occur in a sim, but sims still have their role. Um, I will say this, uh, for my inquiries in working with customers, um, I definitely see Splunk, a lot of organizations moving to Splunk. Now, these are more Fortune 500, Global 2000s that have the resources to make Splunk work. Uh, but Splunk is, is, is one that I'm seeing as a, as a big uh, integration uh, uh, orchestration point in organizations. If, if you look ahead, um, you know, one of the things, especially if you heard me talk in the early days, because I, I'm an Intel geek, given my background, I'm also an incident response geek, as my last practitioner job, you know, I love this this coverage area. Um, when I and when I first came out, I was really, really. I I don't want to say I had my nose raised about what threat intelligence is and how that's not threat intelligence, but you know, I've 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 come to understand that threat intelligence and trade craft and maturity, some organizations will never get there. Right, the sim with threat intelligence feeds will be the highest level of threat intel maturity that many, many organizations will ever achieve, right? We can't all be GE or Lockheed Martin or some of the big banks in the FSI SAC, right? That's just not who we are. So while there is this kind of, in some ways, maybe romantic idea of what threat intelligence being operationalized in your organization looks like, it's just not practical. It may not be cost effective. It just may not be um, possible for all kinds of restraints uh, from cost, to people uh, to do that. So, you know, I really have kind of pivoted around to there are some folks that this is the level. If you, in fact, I have a submission in for the RSA conference. Um, uh, I don't know if it'll, actually, I had an Easter egg for it. I had Swiper on a previous slide. He saw that my, my submission was um, uh, threat intelligence is like three day potty training. I've got some young kids and we're going through potty training and it's taking quite some time and there's a maturity. And so my RSA presentation is on maturity. And if you go zero to five scale, right, maybe four being, four or five being where maybe a GE or Lockheed uh, is operating, maybe four is probably at, you know, maybe many organizations will be a one and that's all, all they'll ever be. Um, managed services will be a huge player in this. There's a lot of opportunity. In fact, you're seeing the managed services players want to add this capability, um, uh, low margin watching IDSs, you know, there's, they're, they're not making a lot of money on that. So the MSSPs are really doing a big play on detection and response services around Intel, around incident response, as they start offering those capabilities as well. Um, the SIMs, they're already doing this. This isn't a prediction. Um, I love the Securiosis guy's comments on predictions. Rich Mogul, he posts the same thing from three or four years ago about everyone's predictions are things that are already happening. Well, that fourth bullet is already happening. Um, it's been happening, Splunk is one example, um, where the sims are adding more and more capability here. They're trying to regain relevancy. Um, some may argue they're just trying to maintain relevancy. Um, it probably depends on your, your, organ your, your perspective, but I think regain relevancy for something more than checkbox compliance by adding more and more capabilities. I also think that we're going to see uh, uh, M&A activity here where sim vendors are probably going to acquire some of these threat intelligence platform players. I think they have... Um, uh, you know, exits, you know, within the next 24 months or so, maybe even, maybe even 18 months. Um, I, I also think you, you may not see just a threat intelligence platform that's going to do all this orchestration for you. It could be, I'm going to be using Splunk um, with, an, with a solution that's going to be ingesting my threat intelligence, it's going to be normalizing it, but the analysis is going to happen in Splunk versus analysis happening on the threat intelligence platform. There's going to be different, it goes back to that number, that first bullet, there's going to be different ways that organizations do this. And these are the things that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at and writing about in this current research. Um, another component here is enrichment. So one of the things that the analyst needs is, is enrichment, make their job easier. Uh, one example I have here um, in enrichment is, and this is a prediction as well, but it's already happening, so it's not a prediction. This is OpenDNS's investigate tool, which was called Security Graph. Um, but basically what vendors are doing are exposing whatever their threat data is so that you can take a look. In the open DNS example, right, you put in a domain name, an IP address, an ASN, and then you can see what does OpenDNS know about it. OpenDNS has, I don't know, 4 or 5% of the world's DNS. 
And so you can start getting some information here. This screenshot from the tool says this domain is, is on their block list, something's bad here, and you can start digging and pivoting around. You know, I think by the end of maybe the middle of, of 2017, most vendors are going to be exposing this and let you, uh, Mandiant did this before the acquisition at RSA two years ago. They were kind of exposing how you could query against what they know. Um, the challenge for the vendors is going to be, you know, if you look in your portfolio, how many vendors are you going to actually pay for their service here? So those that do the best, have the best visualization, the best user experience from an investigation perspective are going to win out. I can't see you buying this capability from every vendor that you have. That just is not going to be um, the case. Now, um, other types of enrichment that, that you would get beyond you know, logging into a portal or having an API on the back end where your threat intelligence platform could go out and query you know, whatever this third-party source is and bring that information back in. You know, this could be passive DNS, uh, passive DNS. Uh, we have Farsight um, uh, speaking at, uh, at the Threat Intelligence Summit um, on, on Paul Vixie on, uh, on day two keynote. It's an area there, GOIP, and we all know GOIP equals attribution. You know, it does drive me crazy in my research about know your adversary on adversary intelligence, you know, in the eight or nine things that I list as problems with attribution. GOIP, talk about threat maps, um, um, the attack maps, you know, being distracting. GOIP is as well, because every vendor is adding GOIP because it looks sexy and it's cool and it shows this is coming from China and stuff. So people that are less sophisticated than probably a lot of you think and associate GOIP with attribution, and that's just a big problem. So GOIP is, is enrichment. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, attribution. Uh, for sure, but passive DNS, who is information, GOIP, these types of things. Um, this is not so much threat intelligence, but this is a pet peeve of mine. I get really irritated when I work with the security control, no matter what it is, firewall, IPS, email gateway, that does not associate uh, IP to user. You know, I shouldn't have to go to a SIM tool to find out who my user is. You know, Palo Alto Networks, when they came out, uh, with their firewalls, it was one of the things that you could do, right? You could control policies based on user identity. Um, I want that as a source of enrichment. You know, I want to have as much information about the person um, that's doing this as possible. So it has a role in the intelligence piece. It's really just a bigger pet peeve of mine is that these tools don't, don't do identity. Um, so we kind of talked about two things, right? The first one was, you know, ingesting of the threat intelligence. Then we kind of touched on the analysis component on the threat intelligence platform. And then finally, it's on the, uh, the integration component. I like to, the analogy I use for a threat intelligence platform is kind of like a point guard um, dishing out the rock um, or kind of like a quarterback, kind of like Tony Romo. Um, I'm a Cowboys fan. In fact, I should say, if you are attending the summit from out of town, it's way too early to see who's going to be in the Super Bowl. But we may have to do a little Super Bowl watching party for those of us that are coming in on Sunday. So if you're there, um, we're going to try to figure something out, so follow up with me on that. Uh, but finally is the integration component. You've got to take action. The analogy I use here is it's like 9-11. CIA had information on um, uh, terrorists that were doing flight school training in Minnesota. It didn't make it to the FBI. So they had actionable intelligence, but it didn't get out to where it needed to be. And this is one of the problems that we have um, is, is getting it out to all the controls. One of the challenges we have with a lot of the controls, they're not really built to accept um, data. Um, you can do a denial of service just by sending a bunch of IPs to a device for DDoS mitigation, as an example. So you have a number of different technologies that are trying to help out with this. Centripetal Networks, uh, Norse has a, has a product for this that are actually trying to take action on these threat indicators that you have, domains, IP addresses, data source stuff. Proofpoint acquired Net Citadel um, that was managing some of this stuff, being a kind of a, a middleware between proxies and firewalls to help out here. Um, so I'll be touching on this as well, but we've actually got to do something about it. And like I say, our typical security controls don't do a good job of ingesting. And then how do you, one of the things the threat intelligence platform needs to do is retire indicators. What's the half-life of the indicator? When does it expire? Um, how long is it valid for so that I know to pull it out of a watch list on an IPS or a WAF or whatever the case may be? Um, the final section that I wanted to talk about um, uh, was on threat intelligence sharing. Um, the first thing I'll say, and I've used this before too, you may have heard me talk about it, is the circle of trust, right? This is meet the fuckers. Um, you know, you can automate sharing, you can help facilitate sharing, but ultimately you've got to get in that circle of trust. If you're not in the circle of trust, you know, it's not going to, um, it's not going to work so well. Um, you know, as I look back at some of the threat intelligence platforms, a lot of them had sharing as a primary use case when they, they came out. 
Uh, but sharing, one of the things anecdotally that I'll do in presentations at conferences is how many people think value, there's value in sharing? And nearly all the hands go up in a room. Um, and then how many of you are actually sharing? And then in the past, it's been 10, 15% of the room. Um, last year, it started increasing to maybe a third to, you know, 40% of the room has been raising hands. So it, it's, it's, it's increasing, um, but I think there's a lot of thought of that sharing is going to be this panacea. Um, and I do have clients, and you probably have some sharing arrangements that, that work well. Um, uh, but, it, but it takes time, right? You have to be in the circle of trust. Um, just a plug to this, if you haven't seen Neighbors, that's the picture on the right. You should check it out. It's a pretty funny uh, uh, Seth Rogen movie. Watched it on a plane. It's short. Um, I, I was pleasantly surprised by that. Um, you, if you're on the sticks list, you may have seen, seen me send this email out in the summer in a blog post that I did um, which called Got Sticks because I've been hearing all of these vendors over the past 14, 15 months talk about, yeah, we do sticks integrations, we do sticks integrations. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time just giving you kind of an update on my, my perspective, what I found there. Um, last year at this time, I kind of felt like we were on a dot race. We weren't really sure uh, which dot was going to emerge as the leader. You really had a lot of vendors um, when they were, I would always ask the question is like, are you doing integrations with, with Styx um, or RID or IODEF or OpenIOC? And this was kind of the response that I would get from the vendors. And this could be firewall vendors, IPS vendors, email gateways, web gateways, endpoint, whatever the case may be. It was just kind of, we're not real sure. Um, you know, this is really, we're seeing a lot of action in the financial services, but we're not seeing it beyond that. We don't know what we're going to do. Well, I think there's been a lot of momentum um, uh, for Sticks, Taxi, Cybox over the past 12 months. Um, the things that I would say now uh, is, you know, this wait and see is, isn't really there. I think the vendors have have recognized that Sticks is further ahead. Now, Sticks had, uh, I don't want, uh, I don't want you to. to or I don't want to misrepresent myself. Um, there's still a long road ahead. You know, I have that in my fourth bullet. Um, but but Sticks has certainly made a lot more progress over the past 12 months than it had you know before that. But what I'm finding in the vendors now is they've acknowledged um, that they need to be doing something with Sticks. There's been a lot of vendors that are actually doing things beyond the announcement. Uh, but I think that the question for many of them that I work with is when? When are we going to do something here? Um, it's still very much customer driven now. What's happening here is that the, the big banks uh, in the FSI SAC, obviously the early adopters here, um, uh, are driving this. You know, vendors do integrations when their customers tell them to, right? They, 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 they don't do it unless they're trying to, you know, skate to the puck and get ahead, which some people do as a differentiator. Um, but but majority of the time, most cases, it's when there's enough customer uh, momentum to do that. And so it's customer driven. So if, you, if, if, you're, if you're using sticks now and you want... You know, you want a world where your firewall is a taxi gateway, perhaps, um, and it can consume Sticks data and, 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 and then send things to other controls. You know, what this vision of a Sticks taxi sidebox world is, pressure your vendors for it. Um, like I say, it's still a long road ahead. Um, right now, it's primarily U.S.-centric. Um, you do see um, some things going on in Europe uh, with, the, with the standard, uh, uh, but we're still primarily U.S.-centric. You did see Sultra launch. Sultra uh, came out of the uh, security automation working group within the FSI SAC. Uh, Avalanche, what it was internally, and then Sultra launched one December, no November, uh, November sixth, when the uh, the piece came out here. Uh, Sultra is free, and it essentially wants to be that 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 kind of point of orchestration. They've actually set up a repository, Hail a, Hail a Taxi, um, so a taxi server that has a lot of open source. Um, 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 uh, threat indicators in it that you can do a on-prem virtual instance of Sultra and then connect to Halo Taxi and bring that in. Um, so you can play around here. So Sultra came out last year. Um, they're, they're making progress. A long road ahead there, right? You're not a product company. You have to deal with all the vendors and things like that. But that, that's definitely driving, um, driving the adoption as well. Um, and, and one of the things that I'll be talking about is where you have the overlap between the threat intelligence platforms and things like, uh, things like Sultra. Um, Let's see, what do I have next? You know, the, uh, the, uh, the NHI SAC has gone out and announced in, in early December as well that they're, they're working with this, um, with Sultra and, and Vorstack, I think, in this announcement. Um, 
a couple of the vendors that I, I just mentioned, there's tons. It's, it's now got to the point where it's difficult to track um, even ones that actually have integrations versus ones that are marking it. Um, but there's a number of them that are, that are doing things there. I think you're going to see more and more of this happening. Interestingly enough, when I see Splunk apps happen, um, people love Splunk apps. I don't know if it's because we're so used to um, um, apps on Android and iOS, but whenever there's a Splunk app being used, people just like it, maybe because it's just, like I say, ingrained. We're used to, to apps, but Norse has a Splunk app that's very, very popular. So uh, Splunk apps seem to, uh, to make Splunk more popular as well. Um, the one thing I wanted to kind of clarify my position on this now is that sharing and collaboration alone does not a threat intel platform make. I think sharing and collaboration is a function of a threat intelligence platform. You'll see uh, in, in this announcement from the uh, NHISAC, and I need to learn a little bit more about what they're doing, um, but I would not use groundbreaking threat intelligence platform if this is only sharing um, and collaboration. I think it's a function of a platform, but I don't think it's the complete story. I'll be writing more about that, but I think the big takeaway there is it's, it's about more than, than sharing. We have to ingest, we have to then avoid being overwhelmed by all these signatures. This is where the analysis comes in, the dedupe, the expiration uh, uh, of indicators. So, you know, I don't want to be sharing a bunch of bad stuff. You know, it's not garbage in or it is garbage in, garbage out. So I, that's the, the one point I would make here, and like I say, I'm writing more about that. Um, I, I think something, too, is, you know, Sticks isn't just about sharing. You know, ultimately, in, 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 in DHS's um, um, mind, right, the goal would be a Sticks is going to be the, the format that everyone uses for structured um, intelligence, third intelligence. Long way to go. You know, I'm not sure that that will happen, but that's what the vision is. And it's not, Sticks is not all about sharing. Um, so let's let's talk about the event itself. I don't want to get too salesy and promote stuff too much, but um, we've got it's on February second and February third. It's going to be in DC. As I said, you know the 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 first is uh, um, the first is on um, Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, we got Brian Krebs is going to kick off the the keynote on on day one. Um, Paul Vixie uh, uh, from Farsight is going to do the keynote on on. Uh, Day two, you know, I I was I, I spoke. I don't know if you've attended in the past, but I spoke at year one, I spoke at year two, and then Rob Lee and Mike Clopper asked me to help co-chair this year. So I'm very, if you guys are listening, I'm very appreciative of that. It's, it's great to be a part of this event. Um, uh, so so I'm co-chairing. I've been working on the content, and one of the things that that we really wanted to do is 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 two things. The two bullets that I have there. One is focus on operations. We wanted to have takeaways, things that you could use when you come back. Uh, to your organization, you know, on Wednesday, Thursday, the next week, and actually implement, go out and look. You know, I'll be speaking, and mine will be high level. It'll be a, a, probably a mixture of what I talked about now. I'll, I'll change it up a little bit, but, you know, I'll have that kind of strategic high level stuff. But we've got a mix of, of, of different practitioners from different perspectives, things from the OSINT front to working in threat intelligence uh, into your vulnerability management program. One of the guys from the FBI is going to be doing that. I'm pretty keen to that. We have the SANS 360 talks again, which are always fun. Um, but we but we wanted to focus on operations, give you guys things that you could take away. We also wanted to make sure that we covered mature and immature. You know, from a vertical perspective, I've got clients uh, on the far end that are very mature. You know, certain FSI SAC members, right? Um, uh, to retail, it's just now starting, right? And they're looking for. Last year, you know, we had a lot of oil and gas representation that were kind of starting their journey. And this year, I think retail will be the. The, the next iteration of that. So we didn't want to have stuff that was so complex, right, that, that the, the, the newbies, so to speak, uh, wouldn't get value out of it. So we've got a mix. I think it'll, it'll speak to both audiences. Mike and I will be uh, emceeing. We'll split up the day duty on that. So I think it'll be a good event. I think one of the, 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 the nice things about this will be the circle of trust, right? This is how the circle of trust, you know, organically happens. Meet people. Um, it, it, it's a really good learning experience, I think, to hear people talk. Um, make connections, follow up with them, you know, it, it's all about people, and so I think there'll be a, a lot of stuff for that, and we'll have events that will kind of specialize, or the purpose of them uh, will be for that. You know, we also have some returning speakers. Kyle Maxwell will be speaking again uh, with Scott Roberts. I'm really looking forward to that presentation. Alex Pinto is, is, is presenting as well, and I don't know if you saw his black hat talk, um, Secure Because of Big, uh, be, uh, oh, Secure Because of Math. Um, it was a really, really good one. So we have a lot of good speakers. I think you'll find some value in it. Um, now, for attending this, we do have a, a, a discount code for it. So if you're going to attend the event 
there's the discount code CTI webcast and you'll get 15% off of, of the uh, summit registration so so you'll get that I know I saw um, some questions come in through the uh, instant messaging on um, on the copy of the slides so we'll we'll give you a copy of that I've got a I got a PDF them and uh, get them over to SANS, but but that will that will definitely be happening. Um, one other thing that I was going to mention is free research plug. Um, you don't have to be a Forrester client to get research from me, at least. Um, um, I always do research interviews. Typically, um, I'll do I don't know twenty ish, fifteen to twenty, kind of depends, and I may have a researcher split them up with me so that we can cover more ground on all the research that's out there. We want to know what problems you have, you know, what needs to be solved, what experience successes are you having. You know, maybe some of the early adopters with threat intelligence platforms. How's how's Threat Connect working for you? How's Looking Glass working for you? How's Threat Stream working for you? How's CrowdStrikes uh, API working for you? Whatever, these types of things. These are the conversations that we have. So I do confidential ones, right? I, I couldn't be more tinfoil hat. I'm an ex army intel guy and I'm a security guy. So I never mention you. You know, never quote people directly, anything like that. So if you're interested in free research, just ping me. Twitter's usually best, but I'll have um, my, my next slide's got my email address. Um, you can reach out to me, get on the list. But I've got a group of people that I go to for incident response, for threat intel, some of my other coverage areas um, regularly. This is one of my last, this is my last piece that I did um, on um, on the, uh, the attribution. This was the Know Your a uh, Adversary, where I talk about the challenges of attribution and how to actually do adversary intelligence in your organization, you know, and not get distracted um, by uh, um, by those silver bullets and, and flashing lights. Uh, so, um, with that, here's my final thing. You know, there's my Twitter handle. Um, once again, use the Threat Intel hashtag if you're, if you're if you're a tweeter and you're doing anything on this space. Um, and for that, I think we will have time for a few questions. Um, and if I can't answer them now, then then I'll follow up on it. But but we'll, we'll give it a shot. So Trevor, let me pass it back to you. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. We do have a couple questions here. So uh, first one: Do you consider CIF Collective Intelligence Framework a threat intel platform? You know, actually, it's a really good question. As I'm looking back on uh, my my talking notes, um, yeah, I have that on uh, page eight of my printout. I, I have also have SIF down there. Um, I will be looking at SIF as well. I, I came out of RIN ISAC um, when I was a practitioner, so uh, I will. It, you know, when you look at the maturity um, for an organization, a lot of times people will start off with SIF or maybe CRITS, something along those lines, and uh, that's how they their first foray into this. At a certain point, they'll probably outgrow, or it's not operationally effective, or it's creating friction for them, and they'd like to have a commercial solution. In fact, when I talk to clients before going out and spending something. It may not be a bad idea to start off with SIF, to start off with CRITS, if you if you can, uh, before you go out um, and purchase something. Or you do both, right? You, you, you demo the open source stuff, you demo the commercial. The other challenge where I think it's valuable, uh, the other challenge that my clients have, um, and I just went through a lot of this in Q4, is people are trying to do their budgets. And if you look at people's um, needs, and maybe this goes back to the hierarchy of needs, what's their most important need? Well, we have terrible visibility for many of my customers at the perimeter. We have almost zero visibility for lateral movement on the inside. Um, we don't have any next-gen endpoint, for lack of a better term. Uh, our sims aren't doing the jobs that we need. So we have all these technology needs. We don't have the people that we need. Uh, they don't have the training, the resources, the skills, blah, blah, blah. So there's all these things that are in line. And a threat intelligence platform could get bumped. So open source is a nice opportunity uh, uh, to test the water, see what you think, and then maybe that allows you to push budget until the next year, but still have a capability. You know, in, in a perfect world, I like open source with commercial support. So Bro has commercial support. Um, Alien Vault does commercial support for for open source stuff. So um, I'm not aware of commercial support for Crits or SIF. Maybe if someone's doing that, I, I'd love to hear that. I'm not aware of that, but that's kind of the best uh, best of both worlds. You get the flexibility. Um, in open nature of an open source project with the commercial support to help you out. I ran, when I was in EDU, we ran Spam, Assassin, Clam, AV, everything, BSD um, th th that we could. It was absolute, talk about friction. Somebody left and knew this stuff. You had to start over from scratch. So, so yes, absolutely getting back to the question. I think it's there. I think uh, it, it may be in a less mature state, but I would definitely include it. So collective intelligence framework uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with it. 
Thanks for a great answer. Uh, next question is, could you please expand upon your definition of attribution? So for me, um, I, I don't even like to use the word attribution at all. Um, like I say, for, from, a, from a private company, uh, attribution is really adversary intelligence, and that's re really collecting the information on the incidents that have occurred in your company first. So what's the infrastructure being used? Uh, what's the tools that's being used, what are the artifacts that are being left in the environment, collecting that stuff, building dossiers so that over time you can start to see, hey, are the same tools being used, is this a different iteration of that tool? Because we do see as attackers mature, their tradecraft matures. Um, you know, if we're to believe um, what the FBI director said about uh, uh, the uh, North Korean uh, attackers, you know, being sloppy, which totally get that perspective. I mean, Sabu got busted because he forgot to go into a tour um, for some of the work he was doing and the FBI caught him. So people make mistakes, but their tradecraft impro improves over time. So if you collect this information, tools, tactics, all of that stuff, um, over time you start building it out. That's what I think we need to be doing, is doing adversary intelligence, building that, not wondering necessarily who's on the other side of the keyboard. You may be able to get some of that information you know, if you're working on a breach with law enforcement, something like that. I don't necessarily think for most organizations looking at who's on the other side of the keyboard is who's out there. I think, hey, we see someone that keeps coming back over time, time again, and oh, by the way, it looks like they're targeting this network, this resource, you know, maybe why they're doing that. Um, but I think if you go back to that zero to five scale, that level of adversary intelligence is pretty mature, and most organizations aren't ready for that. Thanks. Thanks again. Uh, next question is, can you provide more information about what Sticks is? Sticks is, what is it, structure? Oh, man, my brain's fried on what it stands for. But Sticks is basically a framework for, you have Cybox, which is cyber observables, and it rolls up into Sticks. Sticks is a framework for communicating threat information, and the, the goal is to have more information about the adversaries and the campaigns. And then Taxi is the transport for them. So you would use taxi server to talk to another server that speaks taxi that you would then be transporting sticks across which has the information from the observables to uh, you know I was mentioning dossiers uh, on the attackers you know if you look at some of the fields within sticks you'll have uh, campaign associations there's a, a bunch of different ones that actually I think there's nine of them in my know your adversary uh, report that I had right here I actually have a screenshot a screenshot from I think 1.1 of sticks of that, of the different attributes that are there. So basically, you know, it's a structured way to communicate threat information that also includes information about the threat actor. You know, the challenge I think that we had in, in the open IOC world or the Cybox world is very much indicator centric and we're looking for some of that non-technical information, you know, uh, that rolls up intent, things like that. What are they targeting? Who are they associated with? Other pieces of information beyond mutexes, hashes, you know, in, in some ways, if you go back, uh, what is this third time I mentioned David Bianco, but the pyramid of pain um, and low-level IOCs working all your way, um, you know, atomic indicators working your way up to TCPs, that sort of stuff. Um, Styx is, what, are we probably this summer two years old, I think, if I'm right? So still still relatively immature, but but, but growing quickly. Thank you. It looks like our next question is wondering about your thoughts on Sultra Avalanche versus the TIPs you mentioned. Plus, being a startup in Europe, building a TIP ourselves, any thoughts on activities from a geography perspective and Intel tech supply maturity? So I, I will say Sultra, I, I need to hold, I, probably I need about, a, by the time the event, the conference comes, I may have a little bit more perspective. I'm in the middle, if I had to say, you know, what percentage I'm done on threat intelligence platforms, I'm about 20% complete. I've got surveys in the field with the vendors. Um, I've had uh, pushback on some, some, some webinar sessions, so I don't know that I've formed my opinion on that. I think what I would say at this point is uh, it's going to be the, the structure for, you know, the threat intelligence information. It's going to be the sharing and collaboration. You know, for example, with Sultra, you can, let's say you're in the EU and you have, a, you know, another company with, that's a peer of yours and whatever vertical you are, you can both download Sultra, a virtual machine, you could both communicate, um, you could have your own instance, you know, where you're sharing information, uh, threat indicators back and forth, uh, but it's too early in my research for me to kind of give a definitive answer on that. 
Um, I think there, I, I think there needs to be more analytical capability in any threat intelligence platform. Now, Soldier could be a component of that, and you could have Splunk in your environment that that's doing the analytics. So it, it's going to depend on size of organization. Trevor, I know there was kind of multiple parts to that question. Would you mind repeating it to me so I make sure I get it all? Yeah, no problem at all. The second part, it says, plus being a startup in Europe, building a TIP ourselves, any thoughts on activities from a geography perspective and Intel tech supply maturity? Um, if I don't, if I don't get the uh, answer right, follow up with me on Twitter, email me. You know, uh, I, I, you're definitely seeing, you know, Sticks had a, a, a workshop in the EU last year. I can't remember when it was. I think I think it was in mainland Europe versus the UK. Um, typically, from a maturity perspective, we see the UK to be more mature. Uh, UK financial services naturally there. Um, I think Anisa EU CERT, those are good organizations to work with. Um, actually, FIRST this year is going to be uh, in Berlin this summer. Um, it's actually not a bad event to attend. Threat Intel was a big a component uh, this year in Boston over the summer when it occurred, much more than it was in, in Thailand uh, uh, the previous year. So that might not be a bad for, for European folks on the line since FIRST is going to be in Berlin this year and you can expect a fair amount of threat intelligence uh, content there. I'd actually recommend that as a, as a good event to attend and anything that Anissa does as well. Thank you. It looks like our next question is, how mature do you feel your TI capability should be developed before you join the circle of trust? Um, I, I think you can do it concurrently. Well, well, actually, it's, it's a good question. Maybe I'll give it two different answers. Right? If you're a very, very mature company and you're trying to share, you know, information with someone that's just getting out, you know, just getting started, they don't have a threat intelligence platform, they don't have a way to get things into controls, Right, you're going to give them information that they can't do anything with. Um, I don't think it's ever too soon to start building relationships, networking, that sort of stuff. You know, should, we should always be doing that all the time. But I do think when you're actually going to be sharing with folks, there's a certain level of maturity that's probably required. Now, I think what the threat intelligence platforms would allow you to do is, if someone does have something like that, you know, that will eliminate a lot of the the grunt work, so to speak, and you'll have a way to share things back and forth that makes it easier for you. Um, they're trying to do something from scratch. You know, I think the platform kind of reduces the complexity, reduces the friction there. But I do think, you know, if you're if you're talking about the product, you're sharing some type of intel. They better have a way to act on it. You know, having a repository to store threat intelligence information in, but not being able to act on it, is not a good use of resources. So I think that would probably be one of the first things that I would do is, you know, look to share with people that. Uh, share information or take pe information from people if you can act on it. Um, if you can't, have a plan on how you can handle that step three, the integration component that I talked about. I would also say pressure your vendors to consume threat intelligence. Um, I've been doing, I'm doing a wave right now on cloud-based web gateways and one of my criteria, and I'm doing this on all waves, waves are our technology evaluation. Um, I have a criteria on how do you consume threat intelligence. Every vendor I talk to, you know, if you come back and say CSV, I mean, Face palm. That's not what we should be doing. Um, so I would I would definitely pressure your vendors from the firewalls to the IPSs to the endpoints on how do you consume threat intelligence so you can take that action action because we should not have to be Accenture to orchestrate our environment. This all needs if we're ever going to be able to respond to detect and respond to the attackers at speed, it's going to have to be integrated. We're going to have to get things in. It's going to have to be clean. We're going to have to have high confidence in it, and we're going to have to quickly and maybe quickly is. A human is involved, right, because it's going to take time and trust before we start doing automated response, uh, but be able to get it out to the controls, that step three, that right side of that graphic that I had. And guys, I'll also say, too, if there's something that we want to have a deeper dive on, because I know you only can answer so much in 30, 45 seconds or something like that, or if anybody wants to challenge me on something or educate me on something, just follow up with you on Twitter or send me an email as well. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, which threat intelligence companies do you consider leaders in this space? Um, that's a, that's, that's, the answer is going to be it depends, I think. I, I can tell you ones that I think are most mature. Most mature. Um, as I said, relevancy is really important. So the ones that I think are, are the leaders in the space are going to be the ones that are most relevant to your organization. Um, so you might have someone that has been around for a really long time, but they're not providing intel to your vertical, to what you're trying to do, 
uh, then they may not be a good fit for you. I think historically, if you look at the vendor landscape, companies like um, iSight Partners have been around for quite some time. iDefense has been around for quite some time. Uh, CrowdStrike hasn't been around as long, but it's doing a lot there. Norse Corp is doing a lot of, uh, a lot of activity right now as well. Um, I'm looking, just to give you some perspective, I'm looking at 18 vendors in the, uh, the market overview that I'm doing. This will be a good opportunity for free research if you want to do a research interview with me. I still have the page up on the screen too, right? Um, you want to get a copy of that. Uh, basically what I have is I'll have a table of capabilities. Um, and things that I would have in capabilities are, you know, is there a vertical focus? What kind of integration APIs are being exposed? Um, portal, um, a portal versus API, or both? Some, and then a, you know, a paragraph uh, write up on each vendor is what, what this report that'll be probably publishing in February. So if that's something you're interested in, follow up with me on it. Great. So with that, it looks like we're out of time. So I would like to say thank you so much to our featured speaker, Rick, for his great presentation and for bringing this content to the SANS community. So our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in today. For, if, for a schedule of all upcoming and archive SANS webcasts, visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.